Welcome to Flavor Text, a podcast where we explore the intersection between lore, story, and gameplay, scenario by scenario, for Arkham Horror, the card game. I'm Krabby Terra 8, and I'm joined, as always, by my rambunctiously reasonable co host, Kevling. Hi, Kevling. <laughs> Hi, Krabby Terra. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How's that one? reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes up for not doing one on the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. I get a double barrel. In. <laughs> Have you been, mate? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, Jolly yeah. Good. Have you been doing much Arkham of late? Um, yeah, a bit, you know, uh, yeah, we've, uh, st- still doing dark matter, getting through that. So I've done a couple more scenarios. I've since still we done last no spoke. more. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, dear. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, we're, uh, we're going to do another one in a couple of weeks and then we're sort of heading towards Scarlet Keys time. So we're trying to get it done before we embark on the Scarlet Keys. So, uh, and I'm, uh, yeah. So, uh, really enjoying, really enjoying that. So, uh, yeah, that's the really the only kind of Arkham thing I've been doing, actually. Cool. I uh, I picked up my copy of Scarlet Keys yesterday, the investigator oh, pack. Anyway, congratulations! Uh, so I spent a good hour or so just filing all the cards away into my binders. Yes. Um, yep. Yep. Most of which will probably mm-hmm. never see the light of day again. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm doing my usual thing of buying lots of things that I don't have time to play. But uh, yes. Yep. <laughs> but no, we've got the uh, the league kicking off again next week, haven't we? So it will have already been kicked off ah, yes, by the yes, time yes. this goes out. But yes, we look, we're going to yeah. Innsmouth. So I'm hoping to use mm. some of the Scarlet Keys cards in whatever deck I end up building. I might end up doing my usual thing of just resorting to playing Rita because I like Rita because she's quite mm. simple to play. And there's yep, quite yep, a few yep. new trick cards come out in the Scarlet Keys, so oh, it gives her a lot of new okay. toys to play with. So I might give her yep. an, another go, <laughs> another outing. Oh, I, I haven't thought about who I'm... I might do the old random thing again. Ooh, but, uh... That did so well for you last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the whole reason why I did so badly, of course. Of course. Uh, no, it always is. is. <laughs> It's plausible deniability on my part by uh, just making everything random and then I can just blame that when things don't go very well. Excellent. <laughs> Great. It's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, yeah, that's kicking off and... Um, so uh, that's great. So have you been doing any, playing any other games, uh, anything uh, else? Not really, no, no. Not done a great deal, to be honest. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, what have I been doing PlayStation-wise? Oh, I bought Tunic. Have you heard Tunic? Tunic? It's like an indie game. It just came out on the PlayStation the other week. It's been out on Xbox for a while, and now it's just gone on to the other platforms. It's a sort of an isometric Zelda-like game, okay. but it's yep. got um, elements of... Did you ever play Fez? That was another indie game from yes. many years ago. Yep. Yep. It's got an element yeah. of Fez where there's like this complete language that you don't know and can't mm. read at the start of the game right. and then you gradually learn but even the manual is written in this foreign language and you haven't even got the right, full manual right, right. at the beginning of the game you pick pages up as you walk around which you then learn how to do other abilities and things but yeah yeah really good it's, it's tough it's it's almost like a dark souls version of zelda Mm. So you'll you'll play along. You'll you'll get the equivalent of like your campfire. Then you'll go and get absolutely slaughtered yep. by a boss and do it again seven times. <laughs> <laughs> Dark souls yes. seeping into everything. <laughs> what about you? Yeah. Um. I I stopped playing God of War. I got to the end of the story. Mm-hmm. I thought, oh, I'm going to platinum this. I'm going to go to the other unlockable areas, oh. and it became such a grind. It is a bit, isn't the it? the yeah. other areas I think are I just like, on the platinum. Yeah. oh, really? It's like one area where you get constantly cursed, and you've got to keep running around and killing things, and then running back to the beginning before you die. Oh, yeah, it's just sort of like and, a foggy yeah. maze sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's procedurally generated, and it was okay at first, but then it just got harder and harder, and to the point, I'm just like, oh. Can't be bothered and anymore. then there's the Valkyries as well to try and defeat. Oh, and yes, yeah, yeah, tough. yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I let that go, and now I'm playing. I, I went back to my Matrix of Shame, and I got Slay the Spire, which on Steam, oh, nice. which is a, 
is really good. Uh, it's like a card, kind mm. of like a card based, like thing, a roguelike, isn't it? Where you, card, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm enjoying it, so it's good. That they're, they're, yeah. they're doing a board game of it, so I'm oh, keeping an eye on that as well. I think that's coming on Kickstarter yeah. or GameFound or something like that soon. Right, I keep seeing adverts right. for it yeah, in the Facebook really feed. Yeah. So yeah, really good. So uh, we're slaying the spire at the moment. Excellent, good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I guess so. What are we here to do today, Kevling? Well, we've spent the past eight episodes completely pulling the Carcosa campaign apart and all the different paths and avenues that you go through it. Uh, So I think what we thought we'd do today is finish off the core Carcosa cycle by looking at the investigators it's something we didn't do for Dunwich and I thought it'd be a good idea to actually if we look in the narrative each of these investigators have got their own story they've all got their own mechanics as well so we can look at mm. how well they f- sort of fit yep. the, the, the yeah, tale yeah, they're yeah. trying to tell uh, and then we'll have a quick whiz through the return box as well and, and talk about how um, how that tweaks the original campaign yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that sounds like a. That really is what good we're doing, idea. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it is what we're doing. That's, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's 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 exactly right. And um, I should just say, uh, so, I think uh, someone mentioned that we should perhaps uh, provide a spoiler warning, um, as usual. That if you haven't, um, we are going to be completely spoiling everything about the return to box. So. If you haven't, um, if you are listening to this and, uh, and I mean, the first part with the investigators is fine, but if you don't want that bit spoiled, then uh, perhaps come back later when you have uh, when you feel that you, you want to know more, I guess, would be the best way to, to talk about it, I suppose. Yeah. So um, there you go. There you go. There's the spoiler warning. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I quite enjoyed looking through the investigators. I don't know about you. I often mm. will just grab an investigator and then just start playing it without giving any thought to their yes. backstory or why they're in the situation that they're in. So it's quite nice to spend a bit of time reading the back of the card to understand a bit yes, about exactly. them. Yes, exactly. Exactly, yes. I mean, I know for, um, for my investigator games, I always read... Um, the, ah, the yes. stories but but um but yes you're right but a lot of the time they, they kind of go without much remark those little story mm. beats on the back you're right um and um and it's really interesting to look back at how in some ways how the investigators have sort of evolved and yeah how well they do align with the particular story that we're talking about mm. so yeah, it's a really good yeah. point. I'll just stress as well: we're not going to be talking about how well we can how how to build a, the brilliant deck for each of these investigators. No. We're just talking about their specific mechanics, yes. really. Yeah, and how it fits. Yeah, their tape. and like you say, the story that sort of sits behind them as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, should we kick off then? Okay. Who should we start with? Well, I've got Mark Harrigan first on my list, so shall we go <laughs> That's with That's funny. I've got Mark Harrigan on my well, list as well. there you go. <laughs> Guardians always come first when uh, Fancy Flight list all of their stuff and in the, in the decks <laughs> yes. of cards. As I was unpacking my uh, Scarlet yeah. Keys yesterday, it reminded me, yes, it always goes Guardian first, then you see, yes. because then you rogues, then you yes. mystics, then you survivors, yes. then you neutrals. Yes. yes, so let's stick with yes. that, shall we? Mark Harrigan, the soldier. Shall I take this one? Yeah, so, go shall, for shall it. we do that in turn, sort of thing? Because I think there's six, aren't mm, there? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Mark Harrigan, the soldier. Um, his stats are three willpower, two intellect, five combat, and three evade. Uh, his abilities are that he begins the game with Sophie in loving memory in play, which we'll come on to in a minute. And he's got a reaction ability of after damage is placed on a card that you control, you can draw a card, but that's only once per phase. And his Elder Sign ability is he gets plus one for each damage on him. Uh, and a little bit of flavour text there on the front, because that is the name of the podcast. He'd burn, down, he'd burn the entire town down if necessary, but he wouldn't let those monsters take anyone else. And then his story on the back. There were plenty who returned from the war, broken in body or spirit, but Mark Harrigan had witnessed horrors he could not explain. His beloved Sophie believed him when he wrote her about the things he saw. Not the men killing other men, but the other things, the creatures. 
When he came home and went to visit her, he found the reason she believed him. She had one of the creatures inside her, eating her from the inside out. As he watched in helpless horror, she faded away into the air, screaming as the thing finished its meal. Now everyone thinks Mark Harrigan is crazy. Maybe he's finally lost it, after all. But he knows the monsters are real, and he will not rest until every last one is dead. Mm, there we go. So there you go. Even I played Mark through one campaign, and I never mm. actually read that bit of the back, and I never realised that Sophie had been destroyed by the monsters that he was mm. tracking down, or not tracking down, <laughs> that he was aware of, already knew yeah. about. Yeah. So that sort of adds a little layer to it, doesn't it? It certainly does, yeah. And I think that final um, line as well, maybe he's lost it, but he knows the monsters are real. That really mm, plays mm. into the Carcosa doubt and conviction, doesn't it? Are they real? Fiction, are they not? It certainly does. Yes. Yes, exactly. He's convinced they are, and that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly, yes. And... Um, I suppose, like all uh, these Carcosa characters are, these are they're, they're not just they're not kind of hi- well. Mark Harrigan certainly isn't a hybrid, is he? He's a he's guardian all the way through. The only yeah. thing he can take is neutral and tactic cards, right? So he really is a hardcore guardian mm. in that sense, isn't he? Yeah, and I mean, I played Mark, and if I'm honest, I know a lot of people like Mark. I found him quite dull. Mm. <laughs> I find it quite dull to play. Very one note. He's just interested in hitting things. Maybe that's just me yes. and how I interpret playing as a guardian. But uh, yeah, I've, I I didn't enjoy playing Mark. I'm afraid. I don't know what you thought of him. Um. So I mean, I, I wouldn't choose Mark for Carcosa because his 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 mental strength is really low, and so I think unless he's got hallowed mirror and a billion, you know. <sighs> allies around him he's gonna struggle uh i mean his willpower is three so i suppose he's that's okay but i think the problem is is that a five for sort of you know mental strength Mm. is that's that's going to get eaten away pretty pretty fast in in carcosa i think um so uh, you know it's fine that he's got nine physical health but i don't know when you played him that you found that you know you end up trying to shore up his mental health constantly which i mean plays into his storyline i suppose that he's a little bit on the edge yeah. from a sort of mental health perspective and then the yeah. um, his reaction ability what do you think about that it says after damage is placed on a card you control draw a card mm. i was trying to work out how that sort of fits into his story and i was thinking perhaps because he's a soldier and combat is what he mm. knows it's sort of yep. By fighting, he's sort of opening up his options that he's got available to him yep. because he's got all these tactics that he knows through his yes. combat history. Uh, so I think that's yep. probably what it is, that by, by actually taking com- taking damage through combat, it gives him more options of things he can do, I think. I think that's the, yes. the logic there. Yeah, yeah. And there's some nice synergies there with people like Greta Wagner and um, obviously the Guard Dog. and So there's quite a few cards like that where taking damage has a benefit right so definitely yeah i think you know and those probably weren't well the guard dog was but greta wagner i think um she can take damage and find clues i think that's the way that works with her so there's some some real kind of synergies there um as well so which wouldn't have been there before but yes it's very much that kind of shoulder to shoulder let's fight Mm. toe to toe kind of thing so yeah, I mean, if you can keep his mental, him mentally kind of fairly stable, then uh, he's going to be fairly, fairly good. And I, I think that interpretation makes sense. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And then just looking at his signature cards, he's got the home front, um, mm. which has four fight, four combat pips. So that definitely marries up mm. with him being a fighter. Um, yeah, and basically, if this skill test is successful during attack, during an attack, you can mm. move a damage off him and onto the enemy. So he's sort of yeah, healing right. himself through fighting. Yes, it's like it's like he all, all yeah. he knows. <laughs> <laughs> but on conversely, his 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 weakness is shell shock, uh, mm. and for every two damage on him, he has to take a horror. And like you say, with him yeah. having nine physical health, but only five. Mm. Uh, sanity that can get whittled down very quickly depending on how much damage is already on him when that gets revealed yeah exactly yeah yeah, uh, yeah. and then 
the addition he's, he's one of the few investigators with an additional um signature card isn't he so he has sophie which starts on the in loving memory side uh, she can't leave play um and as a trigger she uh, you can take one direct damage to get plus 2 to your skill for that test but as soon as you've got five or more damage on him, you have to flip her over onto the it was all my fault side. Uh, and that's where you lose one to all of your skills. Um, but if you manage to heal yourself, you, you sort of flip it back again. Yeah. So I guess that's sort of that's playing into his backstory of that. Obviously, he's yeah. lost Sophie. Um, yeah. The, the memory of her, the memory, the memory, the memory of her sort of strengthens him. It gives him, it helps him with his skills. But at a certain point, mm. it all gets a bit too much for him. Uh, it's all my yep. fault, and he, he, yeah, he then yeah, struggles yeah. until he can beef himself back up again, almost. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's quite nice how they sort of fit together with his backstory. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. Like I say, although I don't like playing Mark, I like how the cards mm. work. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all very thematic. Yeah, it is. No, no, it is very much so. Awesome. Okay, do you want Great. to take the next one? Yeah. Min? Yeah. Min Tae Fan. So Min Tae Fan uh, um, is traded the secretary and assistant. She has the Yellow King clutch to her, which oh, yes. uh, is very, very thematic. <laughs> <laughs> she's got a copy of that. Um, so she's a seeker. She's got a pretty, pretty kind of min-max stat line. So four intellect and four willpower, and then only two fight and two evade. So she's pretty good against the mythos, pretty good at getting clues, but uh, obviously not a fighter or evader, which is can be a real challenge right because you ideally you want to be able to do one of those two <laughs> so if you, if you can't do both that can really mean she's not really what you would say is a strong contender for solo play that yeah yeah it's more of a support isn't she yeah y- yeah so reaction trigger after an investigator at your location commits a card to a skill test that card gains a um, a wild card icon until the end of the test limit once for each investigator per round so um you're basically giving people an you know an extra pip basically if they're at your or yourself i suppose yeah it doesn't have to be somebody else but uh that's that's the special ability the elder sign effect is plus one you may choose a skill card committed to this skill test and return it to its owner's hand after this test ends so um yeah if there's a skill card so and her quote is, you can depend on me to guide you through the unknown. So I think, you know, that plays into her, you know, being a sort of a, a support kind of person in that way. She's got seven physical and mental strength, which is pretty good, actually. She's She is she can take Seeker and Survivor cards. So Seeker cards, not to five, obviously neutral cards, and then Survivor cards, not to two. So she's sort of a Seeker sort of row survivor sorry uh hybrid mm. um in that way um and her backstory is men never felt like she belonged in america things were even harder for her family before they moved before they moved being vet- vietnamese in korea under japanese rule she worked hard to get her college degree reminding herself that her parents had sacrificed much to come to the states finally her father became acquainted with a man from arkham mr thomas who offered min a job at his office he was kind to her at first but then he started reading the king in yellow and his demeanor changed completely he lent it to min but she dared not read past the first act good job the second <laughs> act is when you go mad three weeks later mr thomas was found dead having taken his own life and the king in yellow is the key to the truth so very much leading into the king in yellow there and uh the stories i don't think mr thomas is in the stories but uh, very much in terms of not reading the second act and it sort of driving you mad and those mm-hmm. sorts of things and, it, and it, through. it feeds into the start of the campaign, doesn't it? Because and it's almost as though she yes. wants to find out more. Let's go and see the play, and so on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Um, yeah, I I have. I think I've played Min once, maybe, but uh, because I tend to play solo, even even in multiplayer, I don't think her special abilities are that strong. 
they feel a bit undercooked, to be honest. Mm. Uh, and on top of that, we'll get into this, but um, uh, I think having the king in yellow, the actual, as a weakness, is kind of quite challenging as well. So um, she doesn't, I don't think she's a particularly popular investigator for people to, 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 to use um, because there's just a lot of other seekers who are much stronger, I think. Yeah, I yeah. think. Have you ever played her? I've not. Again, no, again, no, like you, I tend to play solo, so um, a, a multiplayer focused investigator wouldn't last very mm. long in my hands. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I've, I've seen her played a lot early on, but obviously, like you say, when there wasn't so much choice, maybe when Carcosa was relatively new. Uh, I saw her in multiplayer games, but since then, not so much. Like you say, I think like you say, there's better yeah. there's, there's better choices out there now. Sorry, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, there are. And I mean, the other thing is her weakness is the king in yellow, the tome itself. Uh, and it's a zero-cost asset. Um, it's king in yellow, act one. Put the king in yellow into play in your threat area. It cannot leave play except through the reaction ability below. You cannot commit exactly one or two cards to a skill test. So it basically stops you from committing cards to a skill test. Uh, I guess that also and stops you helping other people as well because you can only commit yeah, one card to another person. Exactly. And after a skill test is successful in which Min Tae Fan has committed at least six matching skill icons for that test... Discard the king in yellow, which is really, I mean, basically, you've got to kind of stack her deck with all kinds of wild cards, basically, yeah. to actually manage that weakness. Yeah, it's quite a tough it's, one. It's, it, and it takes up a hand slot. Uh, it's quite a crippling weakness to have. And so I think it just means people are like, oh, bugger that. That's just <laughs> too difficult. Like, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not taking that on board uh, because once that's down on the table, you know, it, it's not so, I mean, it's not so bad at the very beginning of the game where you've got lots of cards, but if you get this towards the end of the game, you're stuffed, yes. basically. Yes. You know what I mean? You're absolutely stuffed. So it feels, I'm surprised they haven't nerfed it, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> In some way, because it just feels punishing um, in a way that other investigators just don't have such a punishing weakness. So, yeah. Um, and then her, her, her other signature card is uh, Analytical Mind. Um, I'm just bringing it up now. Um, which is is has got two... Only two wild card pips on it. Mm. It's a three cost asset. Uh, you can commit one card. I guess you can make it a three willpower with your own skill. You may so, commit one card to each skill test performed by an investigator at another location. Um, so it allows you to do that. And reaction trigger after you commit exactly one card to a skill test, exhaust analytical mind and draw a card. So it's quite, it's not bad. Um, but you know, it's a three cost asset. You'd have to draw it. You'd have to get it out and it doesn't really, I mean, it, it definitely feeds in again to her support role and her abilities and her knowledge. So I like that about it. Uh, it's a pretty good card, but, um, yeah, yes. I think Min is, is, is one we would, we don't see come up as an investigator. Maybe I should play it for, uh, I'm thinking maybe I should challenge myself with <laughs> play it for the for the league. Bring oh, a multiplayer boy. investigator to a solo league, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, not. So there we go, that's Min. Okay. Uh next we have Safina Rousseau, the painter. Uh she's treated as artist, funnily enough, with her being a painter. Uh, as opposed to a painter and decorator, I guess. Uh her stats are four two two four, so um yeah, again, not so good on the combat, but at least she can get out of uh, get out of the way of enemies, uh, and she's got the will the high willpower stats to help on the on the various treacheries. Mm. Um, she's only got five physical health, but nine sanity, so it's like the opposite of Mark. Mm. Um, yeah, wow. And then her forced effect is when she draws her opening hand, you draw thirteen cards instead of your normal. 
and out hmm. of that 13 you can choose up to five events to place beneath her yep and then you keep eight cards and then any that are left over get discarded so i guess if you yeah if you drew six events and you didn't want to keep that event in your opening hand hmm. yeah anyway uh, yeah. So, so does that? But still, if you still draw weaknesses, you would replace those, right? I, I assume so. Yes. Yes, yeah. you would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just would, that you don't yeah. get a mulligan out of that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. then her, she as an action, she can choose one of the events beneath her card and draw mm. it, and then that doesn't provoke an attack of opportunity. So it's almost like she's got this reserve of events that she can call on. Um, mm. Throughout the game, probably I think things she's seen or things she's painted, and she she, yep. she knows how to handle certain situations. I don't know. Mm. Uh, and then at uh, the back of her card, um, she's rogue level not to five, neutral level not to five, and mystic mm. not to two. Mm. Um, and her backstory is even when she was young, Safina's alluring paintings drew the eyes of many. When an art collector from Paris visited Tahiti and discovered Safina, he offered to support her work in exchange for her services, creating imitations. Her keen eye and steady hand were perfect for the task, and Safina found the art of forgery to be more engaging and captivating than she'd imagined. Her most recent work came from an anonymous stranger with deep pockets, who tasked her with recreating a panorama <laughs> of a strange alien city. When she completed the final stroke, she was sent hurtling into the world of the painting, she only barely survived the ordeal, passing out from exhaustion. When she awoke in her gallery, she knew it had been real. So another bit of doubt or conviction there. She was convinced it was real, but if she told anyone, they'd think she was crazy. Making it up. Yeah. So, um... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, five events that you can place under it and pull into your hand at any time as an extra action. Yeah, I think I'm trying to remember whether I played Safina or not. I think I might have. But I can't remember her making much of an impression on me, I'm afraid. Mm. Uh, is she someone you've played much? Yeah, I mean, in the Investigator game, she's she's one of the top top um, performers, actually. Uh, right. And I think it's because there's two reasons for that. She can take Leo De Luca, so she can she can take you know the, some good rogue allies. Um, because she can take rogue cards level not to five, so there's 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 some really good ones she can take there, um, and also just having those events is really you know it just gives you more flexibility, um, and also she's mystic, so she's a rogue mystic. She can take mystic cards not to two, which means even though her fight and her intellect are low, it doesn't matter because you can you know you can use shriveling and course, other sorts yes. of things right only the base in versions, place yeah. of that yeah exactly but it does mean that even though she's got low stats and a couple of things it kind of she can offset those with um with some mystic cards as well and then in you know in rogue she's got skeleton keys and all sorts of things so she's very flexible yes. from that perspective um and so it does mean that she she she's pretty pretty good. It's just that five physical. That's the thing you've got to be really careful about yeah. because um, you know she can't take too much physical damage. But again, there's ways to soak soak mm. that up. And nine nine mental strength is really handy in Carcosa. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think she's 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 pretty good actually. Um, and definitely good in solo play as well as multiplayer because of that flexibility that she has. Yeah, uh, I think, I think I'll, she's pretty I think good. I'll have to give her another go. I probably didn't have a very good deck when I gave her a go. I think I might have just used her in a one-off rather than tried her in a campaign. Uh, yeah, yep. So I didn't really get the best yeah. out of her. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just a quick look at her signature cards. She's got multiple copies of The Painted World. I think it was three copies, mm. wasn't it? Um, yep. It's an event, but it's an event you can't place beneath her. Um, yep, and then you play it as an exact copy of one of the other events that isn't exceptional beneath Safina. So that, again, yep. that's giving you more flexibility, isn't it, to uh, to play yes. those events that you've already pre-selected uh, without using yep. them up. Um, but yes. because there's, I think, three of these cards. Once you've used it, it goes out of the game rather than going into your discard pile. So there's no way you can recycle them. 
Yeah. And then her yeah. weakness is stars of Hyades. Hyades, however you're supposed to pronounce that. I'm going to say Hyades. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, as a revelation, <laughs> randomly choose an event from beneath Safina and remove it from the game. And if you can't, you take a damage and a horror. If you've got five or more cards in your deck, you shuffle it back into your deck instead of discarding it. So that's potentially quite nasty for Safina, isn't it? Because she can gradually be whittling mm. away those events you've been saving up. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's one of the higher Elder Sign effects. I just realised the plus three. Oh, I missed oh, the Elder wow. Sign. Yes, I didn't talk about that, did I? A plus three, and you can choose an event and draw it. Mm. Yeah, that is a good one. That is good, actually, because... You know, you could expect to draw an Elder Sign what at least once a game. Mm. So um, plus, even if the plus three is sort of redundant, that's pretty good, being able to get an event out. Yeah, because that know, would cost you an action know. normally. So uh, yep. yeah, you're yeah. saving an action and getting a plus three boost. Very nice. Yeah. 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 Okay. Who's next? Yes. Um, Akachi, yeah? Okay. Akachi. Um, uh, she's a, a shaman, a uh, mystic. Um, yeah, so, um, she's, uh, as you would expect, high willpower, five willpower, um, three fight, three agility, only two on intellect, but, you know, it doesn't matter so much for mystics because it's the, it's the five yes. willpower because you can use it, that for all kinds of things. Definitely. Uh, Kachi's pretty good because... It's all about charges. So when assets enter play, they get an additional charge on them. That's her special ability. So that's handy, you know, like Definitely. with your, you know, whatever it might be, your, your um, shriveling or whatever, you get an extra charge. Uh, I think there is quite a few mystic cards that ch- help add other charges as well. So you could basically get a lot out of your assets, you know, relatively easily. And her Elder Sign effect is a plus one and add a charge to an asset you control so very much about you know those sorts of adding charges to assets um i mean i suppose it's not really there's not really a special ability in the sense that you get it you're kind of able to leverage the assets you have in some way but it definitely means that your assets are going to hang around and and be usable even in fact if you've used something up if you hit the elder sign you can add a charge to something. Yeah. And actually, Mystics have quite a lot of cards that allow you to, you know, find Elder Signs. <laughs> so Akachi could do some of that Chaos Bag manipulation to kind of keep the charges coming. Mm. Uh, I will journey to the lands beyond. I don't fear them. Uh, six and eight. So she's six physical, eight mental. So pretty good, nice and balanced, lots of mental strength. Um, she's Mystic. And mystic and mystic, so she's a sort of a true mystic uh, in that way. Um, so uh, she can take a cult cards level zero, which I'm assuming there are cards in other other um, areas that she can draw on. I'm not sure. Um, and her backstory is: as a young girl in Nigeria, Akachi became used to being set apart. Her habits of chattering away at thin air and secluding herself from other children led her village to believe that she was mad. Her village, Dibia, was the first to see her true potential. He believed Akachi was marked by the spirits for greatness, and he taught her how to commune with them to her advantage. After his tutelage, Akachi grew into a wise young leader, respected not just in her village, but in every community she aided. She now meets her destiny head-on, seeking out unnatural troubles that only her knowledge can stop. So not so much linked to the King in Yellow so explicitly, uh, like some of the others are, but um, yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Have you played Akachi at all? I Hopefully. don't think I have. This is this is really revealing my lack of experience in the game, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the the only reason I know any of these is because of the investigator yeah. games. That's one of the reasons I, think, I did it so I would at least get to play them yeah. once. I think I think early on in the game, I don't know why, I tended to avoid mystics. I don't know if I thought they were more complex and I was still learning. I don't know. And it's only relatively recently I've I've really enjoyed playing Mystics. 
with Dexter, etc. But yes, um, I'd, I'd, it's another one I need to revisit. Hmm. I'm not sure, I don't know that she's such a popular mystic because her special abilities are not, you know, amazing in that sense. I mean, yes, she get an extra charge, but, you know, compared to um, some of the other mystics that allow you to, uh, which, is the, which, is the, which is the one that the mystic, you mess with the chaos bag and you can draw three chaos tokens. Oh, get her name Jacqueline is it Jacqueline oh, yeah. or something like that you know <laughs> those sorts of things you know Akachi okay you add an extra charge so it's fairly functional yes in that way so not terribly exciting um but you know not not terrible yeah now her um her special cards were spirit speaker um which is a, a two cost asset uh it's got uh, three pips down the side with a wild card, willpower, and intellect. Catch a deck. Exhaust spirit speaker. Choose an asset you control with charges. Either return that asset to your hand or move all charges from that asset to your resource pool as resources and discard that asset. So that's a really nice card because you can bounce something back to your hand and then play it out again with the full lot, lot of charges on it, plus one. Um, or if you don't need it, you can take them as resources and play something else, right? Yeah. So, nice. And, I, I, and, it, and it's a fast action. Even better. I did look up the, the little subheading there, Envoy of the Alusi, and that is the the Alusi or the Arusi or the Arunzi are spirits worshipped in the Igbo religion from that area that uh, right. yep. came from. Um, and in their religion, they believe there are multiple realms. There's the realms of the living, the realms of the dead, and the realms of the unborn. So that sort of ties in with the, the theme of, of the character there, being able to you know, speak with the spirits. Uh, and then again, that's going to touch on to the next card as well, isn't it? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, really, it's, really, it's a really quite a... It's a great card if you get it and if you can get it down on the table because... It allows you to use your spells and then bounce them back and replay them again. So yeah, it made the mo- really makes good. the most out of her ability of getting the extra charges. It on does, it? it it does, and um, so this is what I mean about Min. Like Min just seems like her weakness is so strong, and her but her 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 signature asset isn't that great. You know what I mean? So she's sort of a bit hampered. Um, and then angered spirits is her. Signature weakness, uh, put angered spirits into play in your threat area. Fast action, exhaust a spell asset, move one charge from that asset to angered spirit. When the game ends, if angered spirits has fewer than four charges on it, you suffer a physical trauma. So here's the thing, right? You you know, you can do that, move a charge, you know, maybe you can bounce it back. And like if you have your other card in play, this is going to be nothing. This is going to be easy, right? But even if you don't get the four charges on it. Okay, you take a physical trauma. It's not the end of the world. No. Um, so, yeah, not too bad, actually. I guess thematically as well, you've angered the spirit, so they're sort of demanding back the gifts that they've given yes. you, I guess, something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Nice. So it's really like a mirror mirror image of Spirit Speaker in a really nice way. Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, so then we'll move on to the survivor of the pack, William Yorick. Mm-hmm. Um, he's I knew him well. <laughs> the grave digger. <laughs> um, so his stat line is three, two, four, three. So he's high on combat and sort of reasonable on both willpower and evasion. Just a bit low on the old intellect. Um, He's got the trait of Warden. I'm not sure if there's many other cards who refer to Warden. but okay. Uh, as a reaction, after he defeats an enemy, you can play an asset from your discard pile, paying its cost once per round. His Elder Sign effect is a plus two, and if it's successful, you will return a card from your discard pile to your hand. So I am but a simple player in this drama, but if I'm lucky, I'll live to see the curtains fall. Um, quite, I think I think it's almost like an in joke in with him being the grave digger and his abilities are pulling things back from your discard pile because in games like Magic <laughs> the Gathering they call the discard pile yes. the graveyard. So uh, 
yeah, little bit of yeah, an in-joke yeah. there, I think. Yes, yeah. Um, he's basically not five survivor, not five neutral, and not two guardian cards. Um, and then his backstory is William Yorick never wanted to be a grave digger. He had trained to be an actor, and he'd worked for years in Boston taking whatever parts were available. Shakespeare was the best stuff, of course, but after many years and hardly any roles, he was forced to admit that the stage was not his destiny. Digging graves was tedious work, but the dead made for an excellent audience, and William always did love a soliloquy. The job took a dark turn when he found a, found a degenerate creatures eating the dead in their graves. Ever since that night, Yorick has kept the creatures at bay, using whatever means he can to protect the dead. Mm-hmm. So he's a mm. he's a very popular survivor, isn't he, Yorick? He's mm, quite strong. He is. he is with his ability to yes. recycle cards out of his graveyard. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Lots, lots of uh, sort of bonuses and boosts there, and lots of recursion. Uh, just a quick look at his signature cards. So the first one is bury them deep. Um, it's an event that has willpower, combat, and a wild card pip. Um, it's traded as task. Again, that's not something I've seen much of before. Um, and it has a fast action. You can play. You play it after you've defeated a non-elite enemy at your location, and then you can add that enemy and this card to the victory display, which gives you a victory point. Though this be madness. Yet there is method in it, William Shakespeare, Hamlet. So it's it's a good way of getting rid of persistent enemies permanently. Get them into the victory display so they can't come back and may as well get yourself an XP out of it while you're at it. Yep. Yeah, it's nice. And then Graveyard Ghouls uh, is his weakness, which is essentially what is referred to in his backstory, uh, particularly when you look at the picture. Um, you've got these ghouls sitting over the graves eating the dead. Um, so they are a an enemy uh, weakness. I think that's the first enemy we've seen so far, isn't it, in, mm. this, in this suite mm -hmm. of investigators? Three fight, three health, two evade. They are humanoid monster and ghoul, and their prey is William Yorick only. So that's, I think that's probably the first use of prey only, isn't it, in the game? Mm. So uh, it, it catches people out sometimes, but that means they'll basically ignore everyone except William Yorick, won't they? Uh, they are Hunter, um, and then while they're engaged with you, cards cannot leave your discard pile, so they lock down your ability while while they're engaged. Uh, and then a bit of flavour, some more Shakespeare there. Hell is empty, and all the devils are here from the Tempest. Yeah, so not not really linked to Carcosa per se. In fact, ghouls are really kind of linked to the the sort of opening campaign, really, yes. if anything. But... Um... Which makes me wonder whether maybe he was originally intended to be a uh, investigator for that one. I'm not sure, but I suppose the tenuous yes. link is he was originally an actor, and it starts with a play. So maybe he was interested ah, in going to the theatre. that's true. Theater. That's true. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and on yes. that note, that will bring us to our final investigator, won't it? Ah, yes, Lola. Lola Hayes. Yes. Um, very interesting investigator who's had a bit of a bit of a makeover recently. Um, <laughs> so Lola is a, it's really quite different. Uh, stat line, as you can see, is three across the board. She's an actress and performer. Uh, forced after you draw your opening hand, choose a role. Uh, you can pl only play, commit, or, or trigger abilities on neutral cards or cards of your role. Fast action, switch a role once per round. Um, Elder Sign plus two, you may switch roles. Perhaps this would be her big com comeback. Six of each, strength and um, uh, mental strength. And she's the, the first and, and until recently only neutral investigator. That's right, exactly. Um, yeah, because Charlie Kane, I think, is it? Yes, in, the, in, yes. The, in the new, the new yes. set. Yeah. So the politician. Um, yeah. Yes. Now, she has a deck size of 35, so it's a bit higher and she can take Survivor, Guardian, Seeker, Rug, and Mystic cards level 0 to 3 and neutral cards level 0 to 5. So she has a it really um, interesting, can really take any cards, and then you spend your time sort of switching around between roles. Now, I think the thing that's changed is there's an additional piece, which is you can 
is it rather than the fast action switcher roll, it's now an action to switch a role or something? It's an, that's an extra, so you, it gives you an extra option. Yeah, so you should, she, she keeps the, the the sort of free trigger switch a role, but then she also gains the action of switching a role. So if, you, if you're sort of stuck in a dead end and you're sort of mm. probably on your second or third action and you've got no cards in your hand for the role you've just switched to and you're stuck, it gives you a way out of at least you can switch roles and it doesn't provoke an attack of opportunity. So... Gives you a little bit of a little bit of a way out there, um, and also she's the first investigator that has a direct reference in the campaign, mm. isn't she? She does in exactly. the very first scenario. She has a different starting location to everybody else because she's the actress, so she starts backstage as opposed to in the audience. Exactly. Um, exactly. They do it again, don't they, in Forgotten Age, which we'll be looking at soon. Mm-hmm. But the, the, one of the investigators they referenced there didn't get released until about five campaigns later. <laughs> so a bit, <laughs> little bit of foreshadowing there, because they mentioned Monterey Jack, <laughs> don't they, in one of them, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and her, um, so her backstory is Lola has performed to sold-out houses worldwide, but no play has been as haunting or as odd as the king in yellow, even during rehearsals, everything about it brought calamity and dread. When her co-star Miriam was found floating dead in the Seine, she decided she'd had enough and penned a letter to the director explaining that her next performance would be her last. Now she heads home to Arkham for one final show, hoping she can finally be rid of this dreadful play. So there we go. Hence why she's backstage. Um, so, um, yes. Um Oh, I really like playing Lola. I I I don't think she's a, a investigator that for, a, for 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 newbies. I think it's for more experienced players. But I think for more experienced players, she's she's great. Uh, very flexible. Um, she scares me because <laughs> <laughs> too much thought to play Lola. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot of it is a lot of thought and juggling. It's good for solo play because you can. You're essentially everything all in one, so you True. can kind of really mix and match uh, what you do. And three so stats across the board. She's got no particular mm. weaknesses in her stat line, has she? And they can Correct. only be boosted. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you play Dark Horse, I'm sure there's various ways you can. But you know, if you had a dark, if you had Dark Horse, for example, you could immediately boost them all to four. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can, all sorts of things you can do. So. Um, Yes, uh, very, very flexible from that perspective. Um, now, her signature, um, she's got two copies of Improvisation. And Improvisation uh, essentially allows her to sort of, you know, switch roles and things. It's, a, it's got two, two, uh, two wildcard uh, pips and it's a zero cost event. Uh, you can fast play it during your turn. You can switch your roll until the end of your turn. Reduce the resource cost of the next card you play of your roll by three and draw a card. So, um, you know, basically, I mean, most cards are going to be fairly cheap, free or whatever, and you get a card as well. Pretty good. Mm. So, and she's got two of them in her deck. So very nice. Definitely. Um, And Crisis of Identity is um, basically discard all the cards you control of your current role, then discard the top card of your deck, switch your role to the class of the discarded card. If the discarded card is a weakness, switch your role to neutral. I've played so many roles, madness is to be expected. Uh, That's been tabooed as well. So instead of discarding all cards you control of your current role, it's now discard one card of your current role. Ah, So that's another bit of a beef up that she's had there in the taboo. Yeah, because I was going to say that can be trivial and it can be terrible. Yes. <laughs> but if it's only one, one, then that's fine. That makes it fairly trivial, which which leads me to wonder why they haven't done something with the, the king in yellow weakness for Min, because, uh, man, that is, that's really crippling in comparison. Yeah. So there we go. There we go. That's, that's our, Lola. And that's our investigators. Yeah. Wow. Interesting bunch. Yeah. And um, with us not having done this for um, Dunwich, 
if you've if you've dear listeners have found this useful we could always go back and look at the Dunwich ones at a, in a future episode uh, or if you if we bored you senseless we'll never do it again <laughs> <laughs> let us know yes in the feedback <laughs> cool. yes so shall we move on to the return box mm. um, yes yeah, we're not going to yes. focus on the player cards. We're just going to look at how each of the scenarios have been tweaked. Uh, so, uh, shall I take the first one? Return to Curtain Yeah, Core. go for it. Um, so, in most of these, there's a swap out of um, encounter card sets. So, um, I don't know about you. I wasn't planning to go through all the treachery card changes. No. It's more just how the mechanics change, really. I mean, the, the treachery cards are, are tougher. Yes. No question. They're, yeah. they're much more challenging <laughs> because they're, not, they're, they're out of the basic set. But yes, no, let's not go through those. Yeah. Let's just focus on the mechanics and the st- how the mechanics of the story kind of get impacted. Yeah, so the main change on Return to Curtain Call is that there are three extra copies of Act 2A that all get bundled in with the three from the original scenario. So it just adds a bit more variety to how the um, the game will play out. Uh, and then the reverse of the scenario card gets attached to the Royal Emissary, uh, which gives it uh, an extra forced um, ability. Mm. So after the Royal Emissary is added to the victory display, place one resource on this card as a warning. And for each warning on this card, Royal Emissary gets plus one per investigator health. So essentially, rather than just keep looping the uh, the emissary mm. and defeating her every time, she's going to get harder and harder to defeat throughout harder. the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the the additional acts. Um, so this is where you trigger Act Two A, and generally something will happen with the stranger, and you'll start putting tokens mm. down to reflect like flood or fire or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Uh, I think there was. Ooze wasn't there, I think was one of Ooze, them. Yeah. Yep. Ooze, um, flood and fire. So yep. basically this gives you three additional ones of those right. to play into the mix. So the first one is called Under the City, um, and you you place horror on the balcony, which represents entangling overgrowth. It says, as you face off with the stranger, you get the sense that he's grinning beneath his pale face, this mask. Where is everyone, you ask, but he does not respond. What is going on? He remains silent and steps back as you approach until his back is against the corner of the room. The ground shakes and you hear an uproarious collapse from the above as vines, tree roots and alien overgrowth tear into the ceiling of the room. You turn back to the stranger, but he is gone. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so there's now sort of vines um, spreading yep. throughout place from the True. balcony downwards. Um, and then any location with those vines gets the ability, a forced ability, that after you leave, you have to test willpower of four. And if you fail, you discard an item or an ally or take two damage if you can't. So I guess it's things are getting tangled up in the vines and getting left yep. behind. Uh, the second yep. one... Um, here is my reply. Uh, it's the same flavoured text. Um, but this time it says, uh, there's the most horrifying sound. When he opens his mouth, there's the most horrifying sound you ever heard. It's as if the buzzing of a hundred locusts and the grating of rusted metal hide an even more terrible scream of pain and agony within. And by the time you recover, the stranger is gone. So... Uh, this uh, again, it's tweaking the, the tokens they added to the chaos bag. This time, horror gets put on the lobby, and it represents the awful screeching of the stranger. And each location with the horror gains the effect forced. After you enter this location or end your turn, you have to test willpower of two, and if you fail, take a horror. Sounds relatively straightforward. The th- the third one is Alaran mists. Uh, so this one is the same text, but when you when you uh, face the stranger, suddenly his body dissolves into a vortex of silvery mist, which slams into your body and knocks you to the floor before whirling past you and spreading into the air. Uh, so this time horror goes backstage, uh, representing this creeping mist. Uh, and when you would try and leave one of those locations, you have to test willpower of three. And if you fail, you either cancel the move or you lose all of your remaining actions after right. the move. Um, okay. 
So yes, yeah, so there's three three additional variations really of yeah of um, what's happening to the theatre, or is it all in your mind, uh, and how those how that affects you. So yes, you you you've got this screeching sound, or the swirling mist, or the, the alien plants, and they've all got their own um, consequences, like making it more difficult to move or risking mm-hmm. that you lose an asset or or, yeah. or just causing you um, horror, I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, the only other changes was there were some additional uh, backstage and lobby locations. Yeah. So right. in the lobby, we there's a the theatre lounge, uh, which makes you shuffle the encounter discard pile into the encounter deck and find the two topmost hidden cards and add them to your hand. So that's going to make life a mm-hmm. bit more difficult for you. And then backstage, it is the prop shop, um, which Hmm. has a huge shroud of seven. uh, But while (laughs) you are investigating it, it's minus one shroud for each horror on you. So that's a particularly nasty location, particularly towards the beginning of the game, where you're unlikely to have much horror on you. Um, But luckily, if you fail testing and if you fail investigating, you can get to put a horror on you. So we will, you can just uh, (laughs) hopefully, you're not going in there as Mark Harrigan. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so I suppose it's reflecting that there's all kinds of horrible king in yellow stuff in there you shouldn't be looking at. Yeah. In the prop shop. Yeah. <laughs> so that, Interesting. that was my whistle stop tour of Return yeah. to Curtain Call. Yeah, no, no, not really, not, not sort of any earth shattering change, just a bit more interest, you know, extra locations, extra ways for. Yeah, so it's, it's just freshens it up a little bit. Shall I do the last king? Yes, yeah, sure. So Return to the Last King is probably one of the more one of the ones that's been reworked a bit a bit more because it needed to be in a I mean it's a great scenario but the first thing that it does is um Diane Devine is now um call is hiding an hiding an oath unspoken so she was kind of a um an asset that was like a a a a, a an enemy asset yeah, she was an aloof enemy before, wasn't she? So. And, yes, that's right. And now what happens is that if she's at your location, you can't discover or take control of clues. And the and the thing is that she will always find the bystander with the fewest clues, but has to have at least one clue. So the other yes. problem was that she would always end up with a bystander with no clues and just sit there and do nothing. Yes. And it was sort of just... Yeah, I think that was probably just wasn't how it was intended to work but it was how it, it was, was not written. it was not yeah. supposed to be that way so now she she operates much more as a bit like a bit like the pit boss in a sense but still not an enemy but you know the pit boss moves around and sort of stops you doing yes, things yes makes things more difficult for you and so agenda 1a is now changed it's no longer fashionably late it's now better never than late <laughs> uh and um <laughs> And so when that flips, it's exactly the same, except when it flips, it says, find the bystander asset with the few- fewest clues on it amongst the bystander assets with at least one clue. Spawn the set-aside Diane Devine at that asset's location. So she will move around to the bystander with the least clues with the, who has at least one clue. So it really will stop you from... And you can't fight her, of course, so... It'll just it'll just stop you doing what you need to do. It's a yeah. bit more strategic. It works much better. It, I mean, it, before it just didn't work at all. So, and there was an extra thing called shocking display that goes into the um, into the encounter set at that time as well. Yes, exactly. The shocking display goes in as well, and that basically is a revelation. Randomly resolve one of the sickening reality cards underneath the scenario reference card cannot be cancelled. Ouch. You really don't want those coming out mm-hmm. before <laughs> they should. So that's not a card you want to be getting either. Because as a memory refresher, the sickening reality cards were the ones that turned the party guests into enemies, weren't they? That's that's exactly right. So these these sickening reality cards sit underneath the um, the uh, what's it called the little you know uh, scenario card. Mm-hmm. When this agenda would advance by reaching its doom, instead remove all doom and play and randomly resolve one of the sickening reality cards. If there are no cards underneath the scenario, then advance. So in other words, it keeps looping around and around and around, bringing out sickening realities. That's right. 
So um, this, you know, basically that's happening, but now it can happen more. Um, and also we've got more sickening realities because we've now got uh, three extra ones. Diane Devine is now a potential sickening reality. And there are two crazed guests, which can be sickening realities as well. Yeah. I was going to say, like you said before, uh, before Diane was just a single aloof yep. enemy that was trying to Correct. do both jobs at once, go around, be annoying and be an enemy you can attack. Now she just starts yes. off as a party guest, but can then flip to being a an enemy at a certain point if that sickening reality comes out. So it's 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 more consistent with the rest of the game as well, isn't it? Yeah, more consistent. There's also two other encounter cards, which are party guests. So they can pop up and they are extra. So they can, they find, so if they pop up from the encounter deck, find the bystander asset with the most clues on it and put the party guest into play at that asset's location. Investigators cannot parley with bystander assets at party location. You could spend two resources though to parley to move a party guest to a connecting location. So what could happen is you could have a party guest on someone with the most clues <laughs> uh, and Diane Devine going to pick the one with the least clues and it's sort of stopping you from getting clues. Um, so that's a n nice little addition that there's a couple of extra party guests. Um, so then you then have three new sickening realities. One of them, like you say, is um, Diane Devine. And then there are two crazed guests, which are the crazed version of the party guests. Yeah. So Diane Devine's one says, It's so good to see you again. The woman in yellow dress speaks fondly and quietly to one, and, to one of the other guests, like their old friends, just seeing each other for the first time in years. Diane's voice is soothing at first, but there lies within it an undercurrent of something else, something primal, something men menacing. I trust you have held fast to your promise. You don't catch the, their reply, but Diane's smile spreads into a manic grin. Her skin begins to bubble and boil as though she were, there was something hidden beneath the surface, threatening to escape. Oh, it's that so? She turns directly towards you, her eyes ablaze with fury. Is that so? <laughs> <laughs> and then the, um, the sickening reality for the party guests are identical. If there are no party guests in play, then you just place it back underneath and draw another one. But if there are, then you read a chorus of laughter erupts nearby as one of the guests dances to the bizarre music. You head over to discover that what is so funny. What you find is no laughing matter at all. The guest dance partner lies sprawled on the floor, limp and bloodied, a gaping, gory hole in their chest. The guest turns to you with a disturbing look in their eye and a wicked grin spreading on their lips. Each investigator at the party guest location takes a damage, put a doom on the current agenda, flip this card, and then you get the crazed guest, who's a hunter, 354, and you can parley with them to get through to them. So you can parley with them to try and kind of shake them out of their, uh, uh, you know, kind yeah. of monster-like yeah. thing. So... I like the artwork there as well on the party guest because you've got the body on the floor with the hole in it and the party guest is holding <laughs> yes. his heart in there, in her hand. Look. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly, looking suitably manic. <laughs> so, um, it, so really nice. I think it really adds to that scenario. So we've got more going on. We've got Diane Devine flittering around, stopping you from getting things. You could have more party guests and then you've got more sickening realities that can hit Mm. Um, so all in all, I think a real improvement and to, to, to that that scenario, like much an, more challenging as well. It's like an improvement and a fix combined, isn't it? Yes, yeah. correct, exactly. Okay, so next we have Return to Echoes of the Past. Mm -hmm. So this was the one that was taking part at the Historical Society, wasn't it? Uh, where originally yep, you had the right. three floors. So essentially, this just adds a new basement level to that layout. Um, that that's basically it, really. I think, isn't it? Uh, and there's a new enemy as well called Keeper of the Oath that can spawn when you advance to Act Two. It says or Act Three, but effectively it's both of them, isn't it? Because there's two of that card. Yeah, that so you get aside. one and then you get the other one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so there's basically three. You, you basically just add a new bottom layer to the map of, for these mm. three basement locations. So there's the quiet halls, which is connected to each other basement location. 
uh, three shroud no clues um, and it's got the um, the ability of um, spawning new clues if you've run out of clues basically uh, the other basement locations we have uh, just bear with me the dusty archives uh, that's three shroud, one clue per investigator. That's basement and passageway traded. Uh, while you have at least one hidden card in your hand, you cannot investigate this location. The next one is museum storage, shroud, shroud five, also basement and passageway. Uh, two clues per investigator. Forced, when you investigate this location, if there's at least a cult, one cultist in play, this location gets minus three shroud for the investigation, so that brings it down to a two. But if you mm. reveal any of the symbol chaos tokens, any of the bad symbols, should I say, your cultist, your skull, mm. your tablet, elder thing, or the auto fail, then you move a clue from this location onto the cultist enemy that is farthest from you before mm. you resolve the effects of the test. Mm. So it's almost as though it's difficult to investigate unless there's cultists around because basically there's a chance that they've got the clue before you. I think that's, that's, right. that's basically that, what it's trying to do there. Ex exactly. It's that idea they've been rummaging around. They've been rummaging <clears> around, so it's easy to find what's left. And actually, there might not be anything left. If you're there when there's only one clue left, uh, yep. it brings the shroud down because there's a cultist. You do a successful investigation. <laughs> uh, oh, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Yes, it's an empty box. Yes. Oh, look. The oh, oh yeah. man. So that's really good because it gives it more of that feel that it's a race between you and the cultists yes, to get yes, clues. Yes, adds to that, yeah. doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Uh, it and does. then the third, the third one, because obviously only two of these would be in play, wouldn't they? It's the mm. white walls, and then two of the three basement locations. Yep. Is the boiler room one shroud, one clue per investigator, but forced after you discover one or more clues at this location, one at a time, draw that many cards from the <laughs> counter deck. <laughs> If you've, Nasty. If you run a multiplayer game, like a four-player game, and there's four clues there, and you do some trick mm. to get them all at once, you're just going to get swarmed with enemies, potentially. Oh, yeah. Or hanging good. around in the boiler sure. room ready to get you, perhaps. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That is, that is a one nasty card. Yeah, you'd just, uh, you, you'd just go one by one there, wouldn't you, just to be on the safe side? Aren't yes. It? Or exactly. just ignore that location entirely ignore and move just, on. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, and then the final card in the set is the Keeper of the Oath. Which, mm -hmm. um, yeah, while the number of the current act is greater than the current agenda, then Keeper of the Oath gains Hunter. So if you're making better progress than yes. the enemies, it'll get a bit tougher and it'll track you down. Um, mm -hmm. But forced, at the end of the enemy phase, find each investigator whose location shares a trait with the Keeper of the Oath's location and move a clue from each of those investigators to the Keeper of the Oath. So if he's at a passageway location, and you're all at a passageway location somewhere in the building, he'll just suck clues off you all. Yeah, I know. He's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't like it. No. <laughs> you can go away. But that really, that really ramps up that idea that, that wasn't there before, that, you know, it's a real tussle to get these clues. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah. So, over to you. Yes, the return to the unspeakable oath. Um, yes, so this one's interesting that um, it doesn't really change the locations or anything like that, which is a fairly, you know, it's in the asylum. But what it does change is the whole thing with Daniel Chesterfield because the really bad ones, version one and version two, have been replaced uh, in this one. So, and basically, instead, it depends on your conviction and doubt. So, if so, the in before it was to do with whether you had the onyx clasp yes. or not, and that was one of the which... best things about the scenario <laughs> because it gave you this absolutely impossible situation that if you didn't have the clasp, you had the opportunity to use the clasp. Yes. But I think it probably just frustrated some people, but all confused, uh, yeah, people, exactly. Which I exactly, it, was it felt brilliant. like a big troll, absolutely brilliant. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you have more conviction than doubt, then you get the really bad ones version three. Uh, and if you have more doubt than conviction, then you get the version four, right? Yeah. And basically the way this, this works is if you, so if you have more or equal conviction, 
the version three version basically is once you find Daniel Chesterfield, it's different. So when you enter his cell, you find Daniel huddled in a corner, the room sobbing and rocking back and forth on the ground. No mask, no mask. He stammers over and over. You help him to his feet and ask him what he remembers about the king in yellow, but he interrupts you. I already told you, he exclaims frantically, his eyes wide with a yellow glow. Don't you remember the last time you came here? His words make no sense. You've only just arrived here, haven't you? No, 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 the man stammers, falling backwards into the dirty cot in the corner of his room. It will never end. It will never end until he is gone for good and he will never be gone. So as long as you are here, get me out. I want out. Daniel screams for help. But the only response is the creature that suddenly emerges from beneath his cot. Before you can react, its tendrils have wrapped around his body, devouring him whole. His, his final screams are muffled by the creature's enormity. Spawn the set-aside host of insanity at patient confinement. Shuffle the encounter, discard pile on each enemy beneath the act deck. So you get this host of insanity, avatar elite, massive hunter. Host of insanity gets plus two per investigator health. It's a 4-4-4 four, four, four without that. If you control the clasp of the black onyx, though, you can parley to reveal the clasp to the creature. It freezes in place, whispering a garbled prayer, automatically evade the host of insanity. So having the onyx clasp allows you to sort of evade this and yes. get out. And you, you've, this yeah. is the first time we've actually been able to use it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's yes, a it really actually has a gruesome piece of art as well, isn't it? That? Yes, oh. it is. It is. <laughs> If you get the other version, there, when you enter Den's, Daniel's cell, you see him sitting on a chair facing the corner of his room. He's scrawling something on the wall, his expression calm. No, not calm, almost devoid of emotion entirely. You ask him what he knows of the king in yellow, and though he does not speak, you spot his reply written on the wall. We both know how this ends. Dumbfounded, you check the rest of this, his room, and there are similar messages along the wall. You already know the oath, the price has been paid, the path has been opened again and again. None of it makes any sense, but your instincts warn you there's more truth to these messages than there is lunacy. You help Daniel to his feet and try to hush, usher him out of the room, hoping there is something you can do to help him. So in this one, you get the the Daniel Chesterfield asset, but also you get... Um, he has this radical treatment attached to him, doesn't it? Yes, radical treatment, which forced at the end of the round, Daniel Chesterfield's controller takes two horror. So you start taking horror unless you go to the infirmary Test willpower or intellect of six. If you succeed, detach radical treatment and add it to the victory display. If you control the clasp of the black onyx, reduce the difficulty of this test by three. So basically, you've got to get him out fast because you're going to start taking horror. Yes. Or you get to the infirmary with the black onyx and you can get rid of it that way. And it's a victory point. So there we go. So quite different now. It's it's still you can end up ushering Daniel Chesterfield, but it's more fraught. Or you just end up with a monster that you can just evade and just get out kind of thing. And if you've got Daniel, that's basically giving you another task for you to do before you can get out, unless you can get out fast, or depending on whether you've done all of those little side quests first, like setting the fire in the kitchen and all of those other things. All that stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so nothing else has changed. It's really around Daniel. They've really kind of changed that quite quite radically one, from what it was before. One extra little nice addition is one of the... There's an extra treachery called Clouded Memory, so you can actually forget one of the things that you've remembered. <laughs> oh, there, that's so right. So you can actually... Yeah, un- you, you can go, you, it's almost like they've wised up to the fact that you've gone and pre-done all of these tasks in yep. advance. And no, no yep. you didn't. You forgot one of them. You thought yeah, you'd done exactly. it, but now you forgot. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, exactly. you either, yeah, it's got a forced effect on it. You either forget something you have remembered; it is no longer true, yeah. or you take a horror and it yeah. gains surge. So uh, yes, yeah, I quite like that. Nice. And if you've got more conviction than that, that's Daniel saying you've been here before, which is mm. interesting. There you go. Yeah. Right. Uh, we turn to a phantom of truth. Mm-hmm. So this was the one that was set in Paris, wasn't it? Um, yep. So, yeah, again, swap out some uh, encounter sets. And basically we've got extra copies now of Canal Saint-Martin, mm. Notre Dame, Gardens of Luxembourg, mm. uh, uh, the... What were the other three? Grand Guignol. Oh, yeah, Montparnasse. Pierre Lachaise Cemetery. Cemetery yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. So six out of the mm. ten 
original locations have now got an extra version, so it's yeah. it's basically a bit more variety in the game. And then also for the duration of the scenario, there's an extra rule forced after the organist enters play, shuffle both copies of figure in the shadows into the encounter deck, along with the mm. discard pile. Yeah. Uh, so just quickly looking at what that extra card does before I look at the locations. Figure in the shadows. So basically this, this plays into the fact that the organist is behaving differently depending on how you've set the game yes. up. He's either correct running away from you and you're chasing him or he's coming after you. The other, so basically exactly. this just exactly. basically makes him do his do whatever that. it is he's doing, he'll do it again. So he'll, yes. he'll either move one location further away from you or he will hunt uh, towards you. Yes. Um, so it just adds a little bit of extra sort of impetus to the organist's correct. actions. So just briefly looking at the extra versions of the locations, I'll be as quick as I can because there is six of them. Montparnasse, one shroud, one clue per investigator, but you have to discard cards from your hand with willpower icons when you uh, discover clues. Yep. So I guess uh, mm-hmm. this this investigation is just sapping your own willpower, I guess. That's, <laughs> That's right. There. Grand Guignol, Theatre of the Great Puppet, five shroud, one clue per investigator, and you can spend five resources to either place a doom on the agenda or remove a doom from the agenda. Yep. So you can either speed things up or slow things down, depending on how things are going for you. Flavour text there. It seems the theatre is performing a show about insanity. You wonder if they've ever performed The King in Yellow. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The Cemetery... Uh, is two shroud, two clues per investigator, and after but after an enemy moves into that location, it gets plus one horror for the remainder mm-hmm. of the round. So it's as though you're in a spooky cemetery. So any monsters mm. you encounter there are going to be more horrifying, I guess. Uh, paths of stone wind through rows of graves and countless mausoleums. The dense, twisting cemetery has you trapped in a state of melancholy, surrounded by death on all sides. Canal Saint-Martin, three shroud, one clue per investigator. While you're there, basically you, your your combat and your evade skills get swapped. Um, yep. Not quite sure thematically how that fits with the canal, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'll let that one go. <laughs> Probably barging into people. Yeah. Yeah, you're evading <laughs> when you're supposed to be fighting and you're fighting when you're supposed to be evading. Well, I don't know. You do. Yeah. Notre Dame, uh, four shroud, one clue per investigator. Any enemies there get plus one fight, plus one evade. And as a reaction, after you successfully evade an enemy by three or more, you can take an additional action. Um, so, yeah, the enemies there are harder to fight, but they're easier to evade. And, and if you evade mm-hmm. them really well, you get a bonus. Uh, Gardens of Luxembourg, two shroud, one clue per investigator. Uh, so this was where the artwork has the biaki on top of a mausoleum sort of thing, wasn't it, on top of an arch? So basically yep. this plays into the fact that the biaki is like that area. Uh, after you enter, if there's at least a biaki in play, reveal a random token from the bag, and if you reveal one of the bad symbols, every biaki readies and moves there. So they will all just swarm in. I think the original yep. version of it just has them connected to that location, but now they all just actually... Some yep. they all get summoned effectively. Um, yep. So I think that's it. That was my whistle stop rant through these six additional locations. Yes. So yeah, so, nothing, nothing really changing thematically or structurally. No, it's just a little bit no. of variety added in. Bit of variety on that one. Yeah. It's yeah, it's fairly minimal. <clears throat> Pallid masks, similar thing. It's more locations basically. Yeah, so when you're building the catacombs deck, you've got four new catacombs locations to to build with. That's the that's the main difference, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, you add four the... in, shuffle them, and take four out, don't you? Yes. So you've got the same number Correct. in total, but there's possibility yes. that some of them might be new ones. Some of them, exactly. And and these new ones all kind of are a bit different in the sense that that they kind of can. They sort of uncover more locations and things, or they link places. So, for example, yes. the Sea of Skulls is one of them, uh, which is a four shroud, one clue per investigator location forced after you 
end your turn at the Sea of Skulls, you must either take a direct horror or choose and discard three cards from your hand. Force, when Sea of Skulls is revealed, put the topmost catacombs in the catacombs deck into play, above, below, or to the right of the location furthest from the Sea of Skulls, mm. and mark it with a horror token. For the remainder of the game, Sea of Skulls is connected to the marked location. So I was thinking about when we played, that would have been super helpful because yes. it would have meant we could have gotten back to a really earlier area, uh, yes. which we couldn't do otherwise. Yeah, because all the original so. locations, they're all just about unveiling a location connected to where you are. But a few of yes. these mess around yes. with that, don't they? Exactly. Then there's the secret passage, five shroud, one clue for investigator. If you control the class with black onyx, here, here we, we go, go again. again. <laughs> See? Yeah. You place the class within the skull's eye socket and the passage opens. Reveal the catacomb's location to the right of the secret passage. So there you go. Um, and then there's research site, which is a six shroud, zero clue location. Reaction. After you successfully investigate research site, reveal any catacomb's location once per game. So you can basically, it's like, it's telling you what that location is. So you just know it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when research site is revealed, put the topmost catacombs in the catacombs deck into play above and to the right. right. And then we got Mound of Bones, which is a one shroud, one clue per investigator location. When Mound of Bones is revealed, put the top four catacombs in the catacombs deck in, into play above, below, to the left, to the right. Mm. So four, right? Wow. In realistically, it's probably round. only three, isn't it? Because you'll have moved into yeah, it from one direction. Yeah, exactly. Um, but at the end of the current round, search the encounter deck for the malformed skeleton and spawn it at the Band of Bones. Mm. So you get three locations, and the nice thing is it's not all linear, so it's yes. going to mean it's much more branching. But the malformed skeleton, I mean, they're not terrible. It's a monster. It's hunter. It's four, four fight, four strength, but it's only one agility, so easy to evade. Forced when malform skeleton would resolve its hunter keyword if there are no investigators within two locations of it. Instead of resolving its hunter keyword, move it to the catacombs location nearest to an investigator. And when malform skeleton attacks you, it deals either its damage or horror instead of both because it's 3-3. Three, three. So. Yes, I saw that initially. Oh my word, he's horrible, three of each. But yeah. yes, it's one or the other. But that's still yeah. nasty. Yeah. So I quite like those things. It's going to it's going to give some more interest to the catacombs. Yeah, and I think as we touched um, on when we went through it originally, the way the map was laid out, it was always heading to the right, but now these yeah, extra cards yeah, yeah. add a bit more yes. variety yes. in how that map will yeah. will will pan out. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes if they come up, I suppose that's Well, the, yes. Yeah. yeah. I suppose you could yeah. force it and force all four of them in instead of randomizing it. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we turn to Black Star's Rise. Oh, this was where um, an additional version of the Cloister and Knight's Hall. That's uh, right. So that's really the only change here, I think. Really? Uh, yes, before, there's a couple of extra encounter cards, but that's it. Yeah, originally the guide was in the Cloister and the key was in yes. the Knight's Hall, whereas the alternate pair, they're swapped over. So yes. that's why it tells you to pair them up. So you always got a, you've always yes. got a key and a guide, but now, yes. as well as not knowing whether you're going above or below, at least before <laughs> you knew where to go to find the key if you needed the key, and you knew where to go to find the guide if you needed the guide. Now you don't know that either. It's, it's just the, an yes. extra layer. I, I've not played yes. this version, but I imagine that makes it even more frustrating. Yes, particularly <laughs> since the two extra counter cards also just... Just add extra nastiness to oh, that as do, well. Yeah. It also gives you more opportunity to accidentally say has to as well. <laughs> yes, right. They each have his name on three times, I think, don't they? The name of the card, revelation, so Hasta's Gaze, Revelation, secretly add Hasta's Gaze to your hand, forced after one or more Doom is placed on the C agenda, take two horror and discard Hasta's Gaze from your hand. So you've not got your wits about you and you're not supposed to be speaking the oath then you've just caused yourself three horror. Which might be good if you're playing Calvin. Yes. I was going to yeah. say, if you're Calvin, this is a godsend. Yeah. Right? Like, eh. <laughs> Hang on, let me just read that card again. <laughs> and then has this grasp. Yes. Uh, effectively, it's the same. Peril hidden. Yes. Add it to your hand. After one or more doom is placed on it. The A agenda, then take two damage and discard has this grasp yeah. from your hand. Yeah. 
it's just a bit of extra frustration added into that one with swapping the uh, potentially swapping the, yes. the key and yeah, the guide yeah. over. Over to you for Dim Carcosa. Yeah, so Dim Carcosa. So this was interesting. What they've done here is they've they've changed. I think for the better the final scenario because kind of what you could do before is if you were particularly strong by Dim Carcosa, you could basically you know get to the palace get Hasto there and then just lay into him till you've done the damage. Yeah. Then you flip it and you can learn the secret. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> it's not possible to do that because they've replaced the Palace of the King. And now it is, cannot be flipped over while Hasto has still two per investigator remaining health. That means he's going to be much more robust from that perspective. And then when you do happen to flip him over, it's different again because you don't get what the secret is. You actually, there's three versions. So if you do that, then it's Hasta's last stand, right? And you stand before the palace of King. Hasta's incessant whispering fills your mind and you find it difficult to block his poisonous words from your thoughts. Seeing the palace in all its spectacle and glory, you realize its true nature. You now know now what you must do. The doors to the palace are open and then you've got to check your campaign log. And depending on which Hasta version you have, you get a different location that you then have to... So if it is the king in yellow, if Hasta the king in yellow is the version of Hasta that is in play, put the set aside recessions of your own mind location into play. If you've got Lord of Carcosa version, this version of Hasta put the set-aside throne room and move Haster to the throne room. So he's sitting in the throne room. And if you get Haster, the Tattered King, is a version, then you put the set-aside stage of the War Theatre location into play. So there's three different versions, and then what you have to do is you've got to basically get the clues off those versions yeah. to then flip them and know the secret. I really like so the secret this is our, from a narrative hmm. point of view, because before it was just yes. flip the card, ah, you know the secret now, whereas now right. it's playing it yes. out and playing into yes. the theme of whichever exactly. version of the story you're playing as to exactly. how you know the secret. So sorry, I don't want to steal your exactly. thunder there. Hand back no, no, exactly that. right. <laughs> so the recesses of your own mind one is, so that's basically is kind of in your own mind. It's a three shroud, two clue per investigator location. While you're at, while you're in the recesses of your own mind, set the base value of your willpower to zero. Each investigator recesses of your own mind is considered to be in a different copy of recesses of your own mind for the purpose of player card effects and committing cards to each other's skill tests. So in other yeah. words, you can't do that. It's a bit difficult to physically be in someone else's mind, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, if you do manage to do that, then it's the writer. You invented all of this, but what does that? That does not mean it's not real. It is the will of the writer that makes it so. The stroke of a pen, the press of ink on paper. You hold within you the power to change your own fate. You are the author of your own demise. So that's the secret there. Flip it back over, and therefore now you know the secret. You can finish Hester off. So, you know, he's he's weaker now because you, he's only got two, two strength per investigator left, right? Yeah. And you can finish him off. The stage of the ward theatre is a four, sh four shroud, two clue per investigator. When Hester is moving, if there's an investigator at the stage of the ward theatre, Hester's location is considered to be connected to the stage of the ward theatre. While you're at the stage of the ward theatre, you cannot attack Hester, right? So... Uh, the delusion, the crowd's applause is thundering, ceaseless. Your heart is filled with overflowing joy and accomplishments. The show must go on. So that's the secret. And there you can finish off Hastur. And the final one is the throne room. This is only two shroud, two clues per investigator. And there's Hastur himself sitting on the throne. You can see him in the picture. Hastur cannot leave the throne room. Hastur cannot be exhausted. Hastur cannot make attacks of opportunity. So he's in his sort of weakest state, if you like in this one you know the most about him you you know i think the king and the throne are one and the same this is the seat of power and his final resting place Th remember that you know the secret so yeah the throne room is actually kind of dead if you were if you've got a high conviction and that yeah and the slight tweet See, there is originally would have spawned at the man's location but now he spawns in this yeah. new throne room instead yeah i can't believe it so yeah i like i like it because it it He's sort of in a more weakened state when you do it. 
and then you've got to go into one of these spaces and then you've got to find the like you say it's more narratively driven Definitely. and once you know that secret then you can defeat Hester yeah because yeah. originally you could flip the palace of the king once you'd got five health left mm. per investigator so you could you could flip it earlier without having to defeat him and then just know the secret at that point. Whereas now you've got to go around to all those other locations and do all the various yeah. bits of damage to him that you can, particularly yep. if you've got the version of him that isn't even physically there. So, yeah, it, it forces you to do more to yes. to achieve the resolution of the scenario, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yeah, which I think was the intention all along. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah that, it feels, I, feels more... Better. Yes, it's it's much better as well. Like you say, having those extra locations that and with this with this the story that plays out as to how you actually know the secret. It's more. It's, it's a bit more of a satisfying yeah. conclusion, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay. So there it is. Yeah. yeah, that was return to the path to Carcosa. Too many. So what do you think, Kevin, about the the return to? I I like it. Yeah, I like. I mean, I say I like it. I've not played it. <laughs> as usual, I buy these things. I don't play them. Um, but yeah, they, there's some definite improvements. Like you say, it's probably for some of them, it is just a little bit of a remix. We've just added a few extra mm. locations or a little yeah. bit of variety in there. But yeah. for, for example, the, the party scenario, that fixes some things that have long been wrong with that scenario that we mm. that you can easily gain based on how it was written. Uh, now that Diane Devine is a bit more interfering in stopping in going around to the party guests with the clues... And then also on this last one, the way that the, the they really do eke out the story of how you found the secret to finally defeat Hasta. Massive improvement. But it was a great campaign to start with. And I yes. think it's a couple of little bits in there might be a bit frustrating, like that business with the key and the uh, the guide in uh, <laughs> in the previous scenario. But I think overall it's positive. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think I think Dunwich was like just fixed up all the things, and so it, I think we concluded why wouldn't you play the return to because it just sort of fixed up mm. the sort of issues that there there were. This goes so much farther than that. I mean, I wouldn't recommend return to unless you know this campaign really well no. because it is it makes it more challenging, um, but more satisfying because. Um, I think particularly The Last King, The Unspeakable Oath and Echoes of the Past, all better scenarios for it. They're fleshed out, they're better, and Dim Carcosa as well. I mean, the others are just more little bits here and there, but those four, I think, are really much better scenarios. They're much more fleshed out. And I like the way the Onyx Clasp now has much more... <laughs> there's more reason to take the Onyx Clasp. Yeah, it's actually got some usability now, hasn't it, rather it's than got just some being usability. a weakness. Exactly. So that's really good. It, it it actually is worthwhile having it because it can it can make a positive difference to in a number of cases. So yeah, a good mix of improvements and changes to gameplay and added challenge and added story. So I mean it's a tick all round for that. So I think it's good. Yeah. Excellent. So I think that pretty much wraps things up for this episode. Next time is going to be a special episode. We're going to be joined by Nate from the Lost in Time and Space YouTube channel and Great Old Ones Gaming podcast. We'll be getting his thoughts on the Concosa campaign as a whole, so it'll be good to get another another opinion on things. So as usual, thank you for listening. Uh, we're on all the major podcast platforms, so please subscribe on your podcast service of choice. And if you have any feedback, you can email us on ftextpodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter that text flavor. So on behalf of Krabby Terror and myself, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>